The broadcast is now starting. <laughs> All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on proposal briefings and the oral proposal. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. We are recording this webinar, and it will be posted on our website by tomorrow. Thank you also to those of you who submitted questions at registration. This helps us tailor this webinar to suit your needs. If you have questions or comments during the webinar, you can ask those in the questions tab on your control panel, and we'll get to as many as we can. We also want to remind you this webinar qualifies for APMP CEUs. So if you're APMP certified, be sure to um, get your credit for that. I am Mallory Price, training coordinator here at Shipley. Joining me today is Spencer Hum. Spencer is the author of a new book called Win. He's an experienced orals coach, advisor, and executive consultant for Shipley. Spencer has helped hundreds of oral proposal teams and executives prepare for and deliver large value briefings and presentations with great success. Also joining us and moderating today's webinar is Brad Douglas. Brad is an APMP fellow and is executive vice president of global strategy here at Shipley. So thank you both for joining me today um, and let's get started. So um, today's topics, um, we will talk about planning and preparing and why those things are so important for briefings and oral proposals. We'll apply customer focus on the importance of practicing and rehearsing and how to follow best practices while you do it. So before we get started, we want to talk about some of the biggest fears for humans in the United States. Um, and you'll notice that very first one is one we're going to address today, speaking before a group. So the whole idea of preparing an oral proposal or speaking in front of a group and delivering a high value bid would be striking fear in you. So that's why we're going to talk about um, the importance of preparing that oral proposal before you get there and hopefully, you know, relieving some of that fear. So a few more. Heights are a big one. Um, insects and bugs. I know I, I do suffer from that one myself. Financial problems are abundant, deep water, um, a fear of illness and sickness, the fear of death, a fear of flying, a fear of loneliness, and despite the adorable picture that was shown, a lot of people have a big fear of dogs. Um, so, like I said, we wanted to address these fears because speaking before a group is a big one for a lot of people. So hopefully this will help you, um, you know, understand the importance of preparing those oral proposals and briefings um, and see how that can help alleviate this fear. So on the topic of fear, I am going to leave you and Brad, I will turn the mic to you. <laughs> Well, I'm going to go from fear to the good, the bad, and the ugly. How's that? <laughs> In the wild, wild west. Um, so uh, just a couple of points before we launch into uh, some specifics. You know, if we can exercise and discipline ourselves to do some of these best practices and implement these ideas we're going to share, and Spencer's going to share today especially, uh, there's some really good things that can come out of our oral proposals, our briefings, our demos that we are often required to to conduct, to facilitate, to win business. So the good can be that if in our briefing or presentation we do a really good job, it will actually amplify our strengths, the strengths that we're offering the customer. Um, and it can mitigate the weaknesses that we might show. So briefing and being there in person, on screen, doing it well can really be good and can really add value. The bad is that sometimes if we do a bad job of presenting, our strengths can be watered down and they can kind of be hidden because of the, the bad that we're doing, <laughs> whatever that is. And sometimes the weaknesses can be amplified because of of the way we're going about our briefing or presentation the real ugly part of presenting 
or giving an orals uh, proposal is if we make it all about us and how good we are, how big we are, how robust our solution is. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. It, doing a good job works in our favor, but if we're not careful, it can be bad because we're gonna we're gonna not come across well. And the real ugly thing is that all we focus on is is us. So with that in mind, this idea of of ugly, um, Spencer, I'm wondering if you'd spend some time. Um, you you recently posted a, a blog article for Shipley and it was fantastic and i'm going to refer to that periodically here as we go um can you spencer talk about the number one recommendation that you give to a company if they come to you and say what's the one thing spencer we could change what would it be in in relation to oral proposals so the the number one thing and thanks for having me today brad um the number one thing that I recommend, um, <clears throat> you know, because the teams are they're really focused on their solution a lot of the time and communicationally, the number one change they can make that will help them win is to pay the price of admission, making all about the customer, right? Let me talk to you a little bit more about that. A lot of proposals, and if you do written proposals, you'll notice if you go to a proposal and you start reading it, uh, look at the beginning of every paragraph, it'll say, we, we have this, uh, we have a team, our our experience, uh, you know, we will do this. <clears throat> we have this. Um, we have this particular capability, etc. It's a lot of we, 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 r, 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 and I like to call that French pirate syndrome. We, we, r, r, right? And that's because it's all focused on us and our solution, as though that were a big value to the customer. When you think about value, value is where what you have overlaps with what they need. And if you're going to sell to them what you have, you need to start by talking about what they need. And that goes into something that uh, Brad and I've been talking about, which is pacing and leading. But if you want, if you want to, um, if you want to open a file and edit it in a Word document, uh, you're going to want to. If you're going to want to edit a file, rather, I should say, you want to go in and somebody says, "Go change all the words happy to glad in this Word document." The first thing you're going to do, what is the first thing you do, Brad? What's the first very obvious step that you take? If you want to edit that document, you sit down at your laptop to edit it. What's the first thing you do? Um, open it. That's right. Open it, right? you got to open it. you got to bring it into the RAM of the computer. Well, the, the, the mind is the same way. The brain is the same way. If you want to influence someone on a topic, you need to associate them into that topic. You need to get them thinking about the thing that you want to associate your solution with right so we call that pacing like a pace car on a racetrack goes a certain speed it comes out it matches the speed of all the cars and then it leads it slows them all down by slowing down its rate of of, uh, of travel right and all the other cards match it that's called pacing and leading and persuasion works the same way you need to go ahead and associate by talking of associate your customer into their challenges and goals, the carrots and sticks, the things they want and the things they want to avoid and overcome, right? The pain and pleasure. Those are their hot buttons, their drivers, the customer issues. We use a lot of words for them in BD, but it's the easiest way to boil it down is the stuff that's important to the customer. And while you are associating them into that, right, you are gaining three things with them. And we can, I think, show those exactly. Credibility, likability, and authority, right? So when you get it right and you describe their problem and you get it right, in other words, you've verified and proven to them that you do understand, and it's not good enough just to say, we understand your problem, right? You have to prove it, go into some detail so that they can see, yes, indeed, they understand our challenges and they understand our goals. They understand what's why we want them. We, they understand our pain. They understand the, the thing that we're going for and why it motivates us. That gives them credibility. Right, that's gonna give you credibility with the customer. The next thing, when you talk about the customer's goals and challenges, you're going to achieve likability, or as we say in, in, uh, in psychology, rapport, right? It, it's really 
proving to the customer that not only do you understand their problem, but the things that are driving that problem, the hot buttons, their concerns, their values, as we say in psychology, the things that they want, and you know, that's a towards value, and the things that they want to avoid. We call that an away from value. And if you can demonstrate in your communication <clears throat> that you understand these, not only do you understand them, but you share them. You also value these things. These things are important to you you have a relationship with the things that drive your customer. They can see you are like them. And the first law of rapport is people like people whom they are like, right? So showing the, and the deepest way to get rapport with people is to share their values, the things that are important to them. So you've not only got credibility because you did it accurately, you've got likability and rapport. And we also like to say in psychology, all things are possible in the presence of sufficient rapport. So it's a, it's a, a wonderful magic bullet. You want as much of it as you can get. Then if you can, moving on, if you can describe the things that they care about in a way that you have additional insight into what they care about that perhaps they don't even have, you are able to articulate their needs, their challenges and goals in a way that even they haven't fully articulated to themselves, you now have authority. And this is all before we <clears throat> have even begun talking about our solution. We're not talking about ourselves. The language around you talking about the customer issue sounds like we appreciate the importance of. You've made it clear how critical X is to your mission. Um, at the end of the day, this is all about X, right? And talk about one of their hot buttons, right? This is the game that we are in all before we talk about our solution. That's why I say it's paying the price of admission. Until you've spent the time, gotten the leverage, built the gravity around this topic, shown you understand it in a way that makes you credible, you share their values in a way that makes you likable, and you know enough about what's important to them that you are actually an authority, you are now ready. You've paid the price of admission. You're now ready to influence them. You've paid the price to offer them something. Right? So that's the one the big idea the one change i would make uh you know the, the one significant you know the key log we can always focus on at the beginning of every pre presentation at the beginning of every indeed every proposal is do we understand the customer's needs and can we articulate it and let's do that first before we try to sell them anything back to you brad excellent good uh, good points to remember and, and to uh to put into practice. Uh, I really like that credibility, likability, authority, um, always with uh, with customer in mind first. Thank you, Spencer. Um, so let's go back to what uh, Mallory said as far as our agenda. We want to address th these kind of four areas. Um, and sadly, uh, we tend to sign <laughs> skip over some of these first two areas and get right to the message itself and, and and the graphics and all of that but we've got to plan prepare practice and then present uh too often we just we just go jump right to the back end and think all we got to worry about is the presenting piece so let's talk about uh this this first phase of planning um just some some basic uh simple guides if you will, will. I, I don't know that we can call them rules but some guidelines uh we're, you're going to hear this a couple of times today be persuasive um a little later i'm going to probably ask you spencer how do we do that without being offensive and, and overly aggressive but we'll, we'll come back to that um spencer mentioned pacing and leading if we are giving this briefing or demo whether it's online or in person We've got to we've got to pace it out. We but we've got to show leadership and demonstrate that. Build rapport. Spencer talked about. Uh, avoid task switching. You know, be careful. We're not going back and forth too often, and losing the audience in the meantime. Use visuals. I'll say a little bit about that, Please. if you don't mind, Brad. That's a a great point. I'm glad you brought it up. Task switching. You're using different parts of your brain. Spencer, I think we lost you. Let's see, Mallory, are you on? Is, did I lose my audio? No, I, I think we lost Spencer here for Let's a minute. Spencer. Okay, Spencer, come back on when you can. But uh, 
<laughs> he'll, he'll address task switching, but it, it really, we, we confuse people when we start switching around from topic to topic, task to task. Um, record and review your presentation in advance, of course. Um, and as we're giving an oral proposal, a briefing, we should always be acknowledging our sources, uh, make sure we're, we're giving proper acknowledgement, whether it's to the customer, to our teaming partner, uh, source of information. So those are just some basic guidelines when it comes uh, to planning. Spencer, are you back with us yet? I, I sure am, I sure am. Yeah. Okay, Sorry you wanna address that. that task switching again? Absolutely. So your your brains work in different ways. You, when you're watch, walking down the street with your dog and you're daydreaming, that's one state. We're all familiar with that. Um, when you're uh, watching TV, you're in a different state. When you're doing hard financial work, these are all different, you know, doing math and struggle type activities. These are all different states that you're in. And if you can imagine when the customer is hearing about their challenges, when the customer is hearing about their needs and their goals articulated by you, their favorite topic, right, by the way, them, right? So they're hearing you talk about their favorite topic, the stuff they care about. They are, and, and if you are accurate and you are credible, right, and you're showing a little bit of authority, they are in a state of mind where they're just saying, yes, 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 oh, that's true, oh, that's so true, oh, that's true, oh, I like that, oh, that is important. Like, that's a mental state. But when you start to say, and how we're gonna help you with that is, they need to switch to a different mental state and say, I don't know if I believe that. Let me do some diligence on this. Let me be critical in my thinking. I don't know if that's true or not. They said they're the best. Is that true? Right, so that's two completely different frames of mind. And so we typically uh, just kind of jump back and forth between those willy-nilly, right? We say, yeah, you've got a problem. We've got a great tool for that. And, uh, you know, because your problem is so hard and it works like this, we've got a great tool and we've got the right people. So when you think about your problem and you're just going back and forth, so we want to avoid that and kind of batch all of your, you know, where you can in moments, take the time, lean into talking about their problem and then smoothly shift in. So here's how we help you with that. Right. So that's that's how you that's what we mean by avoiding task switching. It's take the time, pace them, talk about their issues, then lead them and keep those things separate where you can. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So planning. Um, what does it include? Uh, Win strategies, compliance matrix, outline, content planning. So if we're in the proposal uh, profession and we are we have done or we're doing a written proposal of some sort these are all elements of that proposal that we should have or have access to that we can bring into planning our oral briefing our oral proposal uh, one of the, the questions that came in was how do we avoid the we 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 our 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 in the written proposal and uh, I, I think uh, Spencer, you address that a little bit. We we start with the customer. We use their name more often than us, more frequently than us. It, we make it all about them and solving their problem, and not all about us and our features. So that was a great question. Thank you for uh, submitting that. So part of our planning, let's in the orals phase. Don't forget to go back to what we used to plan our written proposal. You know, we wanna follow the outline. We want to make sure we're compliant. We want to leverage those win strategies that we included in the document in our, in our briefing. Okay, so planning, so important. Now, how do listeners or audience or customers, how, how, do, how do they process information? How do we create impressions? Well, if and again, this is this applies uh, whether it's virtual or in person, but it shifts a little bit. And one of the other questions that came in is, how do we do some of this stuff when we're constrained to doing this online in front of a camera, you know, and we're not person to person? And and Spencer, I I'd call on you to address that a little later as we go. You know, some of the online techniques versus in person but regardless we're going to make verbal impressions what we say um exactly the 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 words the grammar vocal how we say it the tone the pace 
you know, sometimes we're scared to death as presenters of silence, of quiet. It becomes awkward if, if we're not used to it, but there is power in sometimes just that pausing, how we say it, do we slow down? Do we speed up? So verbal, uh, vocal, 38%, verbal, 7%. Look at this, the visual. Uh, and this, this is going to tweak a little bit, I think, whether it's in person or, or virtual. But boy, the, the expressions we make, um, how well prepared we are with our webcam set up. You know, if we're all faded out and we've got bad lighting and, you know, our, our background is a mess, um, that all goes into this, this visual side of presenting. So we've got to know these three areas that make the critical impressions, verbal, vocal, and visual. Spencer, uh, any comment on, on these as it relates to in-person versus online? Sure, absolutely. This is a study done by Dr. Robert Birdwistle, 1967, Kinesics in, in, in Communication. I have the book sitting next to me that, that's about this study because I'm trying to figure out how they did this study. That's what I'm fascinated with because every scientist who's done the same uh, experiment has come up with these exact same numbers, right? So this was a... This was a um, spoken communication study. How does meaning get outside of my head, you know, into your skull, right? How does it, how does just through words, right? And they boiled it down to this. My takeaway for this, and I think this is applicable to in the Zoom uh, meeting era, um, <clears throat> is if you look at this, of the 7%, 38%, and 55%, which do you think you're thinking about consciously? Which of these items do you think you are thinking about consciously? Is it the words you're saying? as you'd see them written on a page, right? Or the court transcript transcript would read back if they had a court reporter, that's verbal. Vocal, you know, the, the language quality, how loud are you saying? How quickly are you speaking? How long are your pauses? What's the pitch? Are you going up at the end? Like as a question, you're going down at the end, like it's a statement. Or visual, what are you doing? In most of the visual, you're right, it's postural. They're looking at you. They're, they're reading your facial expressions. They're seeing how close you're standing to them. If you were in person, you reach out and touch them, that would be, that would, uh, uh, actually, it's physiological is the third. Um, we've reinterpreted it to be visual because in the world of business, we don't usually touch people. <laughs> so you're looking at their posture, right? So of these three things, what do you think that you, the communicator, are thinking about? Brad, what do you think? Which one of these are you actually thinking consciously about? Are you well, thinking about I'm, your voice? I'm thinking about the words on the page. And vocal. Yeah, you're thinking about that incredibly important 7%, right? So that means yeah, 93%. Yeah of our communications happening unconsciously. So whether, so, so when we talk about Zoom versus in-person, right? I've got a few tips for you that can make things like, you know, 10% better, you know what I mean? Like sit a little closer to your camera, um, have a good, have a background that's free from distraction. These are things you can get, you know, um, there's a lot of information out there, you know, on great best practices for Zoom minis, but I'll tell you something, whether it's in-person or it's you know, on, uh, on, a, on a video conference platform. If you take the time to do the work we talked about at the beginning, um, we'll talk about rehearsal, I think that was one of our things, right? So you take the time, understand the customer's needs, understand how your offering relates very specifically to those needs and can articulate it on both sides of the conversation. You understand the conversation about, we appreciate why this is so important to you. You understand the conversation of, a, this is a unique capability we think will produce some very measurable results for you and you can do both of those, that's what comes across. Whether you're in person or whether you're on a video conference, that's where you get 80% of your results. So I would drive you back to that, you know, all the basics of communication are going to serve you on both platforms. Excellent, thank you. Okay, what we say versus how we say it versus how, how it comes across, excellent. Okay, a little more on planning, just kind of, summarizing what we've been talking about a little bit just like a written proposal we have to know our audience we have to know their objectives spencer used the term hot buttons what matters to them pain points whatever we want to call it if if it's a government agency or group you know what's their ultimate mission 
What are they trying to accomplish? Uh, focus on one main theme, establish that at a time. Uh, make sure we introduce, address, and then tie up each key theme that we're going to address and that we're not wandering all over the place. Again, stress their hot buttons, focus on benefits, value, our discriminators. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. When in doubt, um, simplify. So if you're wondering whether you should include something or not, and there's not consensus, and err on the side of, of simplification. Keep graphics simple, easy to uh, 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 read and understand. Very important, especially if you're working with government of any sort, assign a timer. You know, someone's got to, you know, keep pace. You cannot go over. There is no, <laughs> there is no leniency generally in, in giving an oral briefing to a, a government customer. So, uh, and we'll talk about this a little more when we talk about practicing and rehearsing. But just, just a, a couple of additional tips. All right, um, persuasion. We've we've covered this a little bit, but Spencer, I'd ask you just uh, a little bit more depth. This is so important. How do we be persuasive without coming across too salesy or overbearing? Uh, this is always a, a question I have, and I'm sure others do too. So uh, customers, you talk about not being pushy, right? Yeah. <clears throat> customers rarely experience you as pushy when you're listening. Right. So it starts with listening. And then that is all through the capture phase. You're listening um, and uh, all through you know, and if you're doing a Q&A with them, fully listening to the question rather than thinking about what you're going to say. Right. Um, that goes back to Stephen Covey he used to teach that. Right. Um, but the uh, so that starts with, you know, having customer focus. Right. That's the antidote to being pushy, being always focused on how can we assist you? How can we assist you in solving your problem, meeting your mission, and making your evaluation today? That I call that the golden frame. How can we best assist you? If you're thinking from that frame, you will never be pushy. Now you're a problem solver. Now you're thinking about helping them. So communicating your value is all about you, uh, you know, what your audience wants to hear from you. They want to hear, do you understand my problems? Do you have insight into those problems? And do you have some solutions? And how are those unique? Right? So that's and and that is not pushy that is in service to your customer so the to be persuasive uh, and we like to say at shipley the best way to uh win business is to be the most deserving right and what does that what makes you the most deserving well you understand and can articulate their needs better than anyone else and by the way that's a discriminator even before you've offered them something and then also you have solutions that are unique and and you can describe measurable results to their problems right and so that's that's the whole you know that again that overlap of what we have and what you need the overlap is value and when you present value from a service you know how can we best help you uh frame of mind uh you will be incredibly persuasive you will be the most deserving because you did your homework to understand them and to create some great solutions uh and you will uh, not be pushy at all they will they will like what they're hearing oh excellent Listen, I, I'm glad you brought that up, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's sometimes a lost art. Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, let's let's kind of go through the next um, aspect, if you will, and that is if we've done our homework and done some planning, actually preparing the briefing. Now, uh, one of the questions that's come in, uh, Spencer, and I'll ask you to address this here in a little bit too, or include this as, as you talk through this. One of the questions that came in, which is a great one, uh, they're wondering if we could talk about any differences in uh, site visits. So when we've been down selected and we're down to the, you know, maybe one of the final uh, two, maybe three uh, vendors or suppliers or partners, and we go on a site visit. Are there some things there that differ from from? And I'm I'm guessing a lot of it's the same. Listening, <laughs> uh, yeah. that kind of thing. But uh, maybe tuck that away, and we'll we'll address that as we go a little bit. But in as far as preparing for our oral briefing, site visit, demonstration, 
just like we do in a proposal, a written proposal, we're going to put together a good outline. We're going to annotate that outline. We're going to create a content plan uh, for each section and the overall proposal. And you know, we might storyboard. You know, we might that might be an approach we take as well. So, just like we do in the written proposal, we want some kind of oral planner, oral proposal planner where we can do these same things. We can storyboard it out. We can create some, some themes and theme statements, visuals, this triple S uh, idea. We'll talk about what that means here in just a second. Uh, gestures, vocal um, uh, variety in how, how we talk, present. So that's all part of preparation. So this triple S idea, it, uh, maybe it's trite, I don't know. But think of maybe it's something you'll remember. For each section of our briefing, our presentation, just like in a written proposal, it's the same thing. We want to state our, our value. What's our value proposition? What's the benefit to the customer? We want to then support that with facts, validation, proof, success stories, but we can't forget to summarize. State, support, and summarize. We suggest you consider that little formula, if you want to call it that, as a way to make sure we're addressing um, each section uh, properly. State, support, and summarize. You all have heard, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, support it, and then tell them what you told them. So as far as preparing, for the orals. Um, organize the presentation, of course. Uh, outline it, organize it. We want to follow instructions. If it's a federal government, we're, we're gonna, they're gonna give us some very concise, precise instructions. Build supporting information for all of our main points and our main themes. Make sure we develop an introduction and a conclusion to our presentation. And we're gonna dive into those. Uh, a little bit more, what is a good introduction? What is a good conclusion? So that state support summarize concept. Uh, now, uh, this will be review. Those of you that have been on some of our other webinars and, and follow some of the Shipley best practices, this is a common term to you. Others who are joining us maybe for the first time, we use the term customer hot buttons a lot. This is what we mean when we say that. Any customer that we're trying to engage with has issues. They could be financial, operational, transitional, political, whatever they are, they have underlying issues. And that's why they're looking for solutions. And then hopefully we're working with a customer that is motivated to make a buying decision. Uh, that motivation can be they're trying to save money, they're trying to enhance their technology, they're trying to move everything to the cloud, they're trying to increase their security, whatever it is, efficiency, they're motivated. Where those come together and we, customer has issues, they're also motivated, we, that's what we mean when we say hot buttons. So I just wanted to bring that up for some who may not be familiar with that, that terminology. And this brings up an interesting point when I talk about oral proposals or written proposals if we use terminology the customer doesn't understand you know and it's an acronym or it's a phrase we're we're used to and they're not it's a problem so keep that in mind too as you prepare so we also put out there this term common to many of you but this idea of discriminators so why do we want to talk about hot buttons and discriminators here because that's what our briefing has to focus on so an easy way to show what we mean by discriminators, we've got three kind of buckets here, right? We've got customer needs in orange, we've got competitor capabilities in blue, our capabilities in green. Well, here you see there's neutral position, which, which we are gonna have a hard time discriminating. If the customer has a need, our competitor has a solution and we have the same solution, it's kind of neutral. Then there's irrelevant positions, but what we mean by discriminators, 
is customer has a need and we have a unique capability. That's what we need to hone in on when we're preparing our message. Hot buttons, what matters to them, what's motivating them, and then what is our discriminating solution. Can I add something to that, Brad? Please, yes. Fantastic, so that maybe in the middle is really cool. Like I've never seen it visualized like this, but that maybe part is what a lot of clients come to me for help with when they're doing their proposal because that that maybe is where the us twos live like we have it and also they have it well whoever articulates it the best first of all if the customer if the competitor doesn't tell them that they have it doesn't tell your customer they have it then they don't have it if that tree falls and nobody hears it right th then then that discriminator doesn't exist so the first step is to tell them about your your capabilities make sure that you tell them about them the other is so let's just say everybody makes a everybody you know mo the model t you know, was the first car and Ford used to joke, I, I, it's available in every color. Is, uh, uh, what is it? How did he say? He said, it's, you can have it in any color as long as it's black, <laughs> right? Yeah. And for many years, I mean, you know, it, it, you know then of course, everybody has uh, lots of colors to choose from, but still everyone's going to say they make a black car, right? So that would be in that maybe category. But if you are the one who can describe why your customer, this is back to customer focus, why they want that red car, with accuracy which gives you that credibility and you can do it with some depth that shows you share their values around having a black colored car and you may even have a little bit of insight into why black colored cars are going to be the best car for someone who has a particular job right now you actually have a discriminating capability so you've got you could turn that maybe into a yes simply by making sure that you know it, it might be what we call an us too everybody's going to say that level playing field everyone can offer this all of our competitors but if you can articulate that the best of all of the competitors if you can articulate the need for that requirement you may have a discriminator there simply in your insight the level of your insight into their need thank you spencer you, you said something earlier um that i just want to make sure everyone caught um you said that how we present and um, articulate and uh, all of the verbal, nonverbal that we do in our oral pr uh, proposal can actually be a discriminator. Um, and exactly. because of the topic today, I just want to emphasize that point that uh, yeah, we we may not win a contract or an opportunity. Um, solely because of our, our presentation, but I believe we can definitely lose it uh, if if we do a half-baked job. Would, uh, any comment? And I just wanted to emphasize that. Spencer, you said sure. it, but I want to emphasize that point. Yeah. Discriminate how well we present. There's so many opportunities in the spoken communication, right? With a written document, you can say it's right there in black and white. You have this need. We have this capability. So you you may be able to, in that written document, side by side with your competitor, score exactly the same as them. But if you go to orals and you've got all these communicational opportunities, the opportunity to really show your customer you understand them, show your customer you uh, you share their values, show your customer that you've got insight into their values, the things that they care about, right? That's a huge opportunity and it's all communicational. In fact, we might have less capability than our competitors, but if 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 we communicate better about our own capabilities, we will win. Excellent, good. All right, uh, Spencer, I, I'd ask you just maybe um, hit some highlights on how important uh, and any tips you have on the introduction to a, um, a briefing, a presentation? What, what are some key elements here, takeaways for planning, preparing, and delivering a good introduction? For me, it goes back to that, what's the one thing you can do really well to increase our chances of winning? And that is beginning with customer focus, right? So uh, I would show them, a, certainly show them a cover slide, show them the agenda, show them who's in the room without selling them, like resist the urge to sell those people. They just want to know who are the faces I see in front of me, what are their proposed positions, and and what company do they work for, and and et cetera, right? After that, you, the very first thing you can do 
is focus on the customer, focus on the audience, right? What is it that they care about? And being able to articulate their values, their hot buttons, right? And, and, and start the conversation without any task switching, without jumping in and trying to sell them anything, beginning with that. Then that becomes the jumping off board point to then in the introduction section say, and here's the team. So if you take the time to say, these are your needs as we understand them, based on everything you've told us, everything we understand working with similar customers and everything that uh, you talked about at Industry Day and the RFP, et cetera, this is what we understand. It really comes down to these three to five things. We sometimes call those success drivers or something like that. And, and spending the time in that conversation, that becomes the jumping off point. Then you show them, this is the team we've brought to meet those needs. Now you've got a real space to shoot into with your value because you just established what's important. Now you've got a context to put that team within. Otherwise, you're just telling them, this is how many people are in these companies. This is how many years they've been doing business, et cetera. And it's kind of a little, little bit dry. But if you really steep them, prime them up and pace them into the things that matter, when you show them your team, you now have something to shoot at. You can say this, is, and if those things matter to you, well, then this team is specifically suited to help you with those needs. And then on, and then I would show them a uh, a value prop, a, a preview. And you talked about uh, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. I love that uh, formula because it acknowledges you're going to tell them three times over time. So I would, in an introduction, your job is to preview, tell them what you are going to tell them don't tell them tell them what you are going to tell them and how you know and and how it's and what are the issues that each of those things are going to um help them with then tell them in the middle and then at the end tell them what you told them do a review it's not it, it, sometimes people want to do all three steps the same way you are you are previewing in the beginning you're not making the sale you don't have to go into great detail just tell them you're going to hear what a value to this issue this particular discriminator is right and then tell them in the middle of the presentation so they've got proof and all of the proof points and at the end tell them i told you this right and for me the introduction is 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 the same as the conclusion except it's a preview at the beginning and a review at the end yep you got to get their attention what gets their attention more than talking about the stuff that they care about right yeah. set yep. the tone summarize yep mm -hmm. So Perfect. some good uh, good little checklist here, you know, of of what Spencer just shared with us on the the that preview part um, of our preview. It is so important. I mean, making that connection uh, early on. Thank you, uh, Spencer. Um, all right, um, and then you did mention. Just want to reemphasize: there might be key terms that we use during a briefing. If if we have an hour two hours uh, uh, for an oral proposal presentation. And we believe during that time, and we've rehearsed and practiced, there's gonna be some key terms. We might wanna, in the introduction, make sure that they're aware of some of those key terms so that we don't have to disrupt the flow and interrupt and say, well, what we mean by that is, so be aware of that as you rehearse and practice. Uh, what are some key terms that we're going to address? All right, so we, we talked about, you know, the, the state, the introduction. Now we, we move into supporting our position, our solution. Um, we, we want to refer to a capture plan if, if we have that, uh, a sales opportunity plan if we have that. Uh, again, organize as we're instructed. Don't deviate from that. If we've got an RFP or instructions, comply with those. Hot buttons and benefits, focus on those. For sure, validate all claims. Um, empty claims in a briefing are, pro well, I, I was gonna say worse, but I won't say it, are every bit as bad as empty claims in a written proposal. Uh, we, If we're gonna make a claim of some kind of ROI or, or benefit, we've, we've got to back it up. We've, we've got to be factual. And then again, identify and showcase discriminators. So we've got the introduction so important, the, the building of the, the core main message, the support. Um, Spencer, you want to walk us through some key points on the conclusion and, and the, the summary? Absolutely. So 
again, for me, this is congruent. The beginning is a preview and the ending is a review. And for me, it's often the same slide, right? It's that value proposition. Here are all of your key challenges and here's all of our unique capabilities. And you're putting those right next to each other and talking about the connection, right? Except this time, you've had the time, you told them it was coming, right? You told them and you gave them all of the the, the proof points and all of the data around you know your solution and really prove that it does actually help them with the things that matter. And this last part, it is there for you to uh, review and ratify. You say, yes, you heard us right, right? Uh, it's, it's to cement this and make this information persistent in their mind. There's a certain repetition element to it, right? When uh, you, the more you repeat something, the more they remember it, that actually happens in the brain that we say neurons that fire together, wire together. So on the third or fourth time they're hearing about something, uh, especially in this big conclusion when they are really making a personal decision, each one of them, is this a value? Is this team a great value? Do they really understand our problems? Do they have unique capabilities? You're, provi you're providing all of the proof points just to say, you heard this, you saw John talk about this, you heard uh, Leslie talk about this, right? And how it helps you with this problem. You heard Stephen talk about this and how it helps you with this problem, right? And you're just ratifying it. You're proving to them, yes, you actually did hear us solve all of these problems for you. And that is a powerful moment. Um, that should be the moment where they're also experiencing so much value, one moment after another, stacked rapidly upon one another, that they get actually affected by it, right? So the, the, the sort of the metaphor is you want a standing ovation at this point. And if they're not standing on the outside, hopefully they're standing on the inside. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. State support summarize. All right. Let's go to a, a little different topic for a little bit here, and that's visuals. We're not going to dwell on this because uh, about six weeks ago, uh, Mike Parkinson joined us. We talked about uh, graphics and visuals in, in proposals. Most of those same principles apply uh, in a, an orals briefing. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on some key points, but not. we'll refer you back to that webinar if you want a little more detail, but visuals. Uh, they've got to grab attention. Uh, colors are, are important for retention, comprehension, uh, remembering. Uh, some of you will remember certain images from this webinar that others will not. Um, and so that's important uh, visually. Um, it, when we pair on, and align our visuals with our text, it can have stronger impact. Again, for the sake, we're, we're trying to get scored, right? We're trying to get evaluated higher than, than the next competitor. So we want to align and pair up our text with the visual and make sure it's memorable. Uh, keep visuals simple and easy to interpret it or interpret we we talked about that so very important uh, again i'd refer you back to our the webinar we did back in april um, on visuals if you want to to review a little bit more on that uh, this is uh, another one of spencer's real uh, expertise areas and I, i'm so glad spencer you could join us for this and and I know we're winding, you know, close to the top of the hour, but this uh, nonverbal is so, so important. Um, and Spencer has tremendous background, education, experience in uh, some of the nonverbal. I'm just going to point out a couple of, of um, signals here, and then we'll have Spencer elaborate a little bit. Um, just some common ones that you're all aware of, eye contact. And, and does this apply virtually through webcams and in person? Absolutely. You know, uh, there's a lot of this nonverbal that can happen using Zoom or Teams or whatever method we're using. So these, these nonverbal signals are all so important. And then there's the whole aspect of body language, you know? What do some? What is the body language of the customer telling us? You know, we and and Spencer again. He's he's excellent at this. But man, if we're seeing this during our briefing, uh, we are in deep trouble. 
you know, the body language here of this this group is uh, is not healthy. Spencer, take it away. That looks like a real picture, by the way. I don't think that's staged. <laughs> that looks incredibly real to me, right? So, um, so we can target some of those things. We can target, uh, you know, eye contact. We can target posture. We can target um, different things, right? So that is one way of coming about it. Uh, through exercises, uh, learning to make eye contact, et cetera. And there's a lot out there for you to learn about those topics, but I'll tell you the bottom line. A lot of that takes care of itself. Remember, 93% of the communication is governed unconsciously, right? And the 55% of that is physiology. So that's all happening by itself. You're not necessarily consciously thinking, I'm going to circle my hand three times, right? That's just happening automatically, right? You're not thinking, I should look up now. I should look down now. It's all happening automatically. So all of these are different pathways through which, you know, different channels through which you're connecting with your customer. And the best way to have all that work in your favor, including the ums and us, by the way, is to just do your homework, understand the customer, organize your material, get really familiar with it, and deliver it congruently, right? Do all the preparation. Do Make sure you thoroughly understand your customer. You can speak their language. You share their values. And, and you're bringing the right solutions. And you're, you're presenting all of it inside of a compliant format that makes it easy for them to evaluate. Then all of this body language stuff becomes the body language authentically of someone who's thoroughly prepared. And, and all these things very often, uh, I like to think they take care of themselves. So doing the right process addresses most of these things but yeah absolutely we can target them we can we can do exercises to improve your eye contact or uh, my, my big one is ums and us people say how are you going to address that i'm like i say by us being prepared <laughs> right because it doesn't matter if i said uh right before i blew you away with something incredibly insightful to say right it, it that just speaks to the thing that drives you every day right so uh, that's my advice on body language is that do your homework and then relax and breathe Oh, excellent. So good. And uh, this really kind of leads nicely to this, um, excuse me, this next part we want to talk about, and that is uh, trying to make ourselves more aware by practice, uh, you know, practicing, rehearsing uh, the presentation. I don't know how you all are. I do not like seeing myself recorded on screen. Um, so over the last several years, especially during some of the pandemic, uh, we've done a lot more online training. Uh, we, we couldn't get face-to-face -face like we, we prefer. So we've had to do a lot of online. We've recorded a lot of online training. We've recorded a lot of podcasts, interviews, webinars, and things. And when we stop and actually see ourselves or we let others honestly and fairly critique us, it, it can really make a difference to where we can get to what Spencer was talking about, to where some of this becomes intuitive. The best presenters are, are intuitive at a lot of things they do. But if, if we don't practice, if we don't get feedback, if we don't see ourselves, uh, we're missing out. So practice individually as a team, record it, watch it, repeat it, use a timer, watch your awe, awe counter, uh, and someone needs to simulate the customer when we're, we're orchestrating and, and practicing. So orchestrate the entire briefing, online or in person. Organize teams for clear, concise presentations, encourage information, Encourage candid feedback. That's hard in some cultures um, with some egos. It, it's hard to to uh, give or receive candid feedback. But one of the best try. ways, Brad, is is to phrase it in the terms of when you said this is what I thought or this is what I felt mm -hmm. rather than that's good or that's bad. When you said that, this is what I pictured. This is what I felt. This is what I thought. That's amazing feedback. And that can be very candid without being personal. That is excellent. Thank you, Spencer. So rehearse, practice, video, or record yourself and watch it as painful as it might be. Um, these last couple of slides, um, we're gonna just let you kind of review on your own. We're, we don't wanna, we wanna respect your time, and, but we talk a little bit about in these, well, let, let me 
first, there's a little checklist here of guidelines for presenting. So we'll let you review that. Arrive early. Boy, does this apply online, Spencer? Uh, <laughs> yes, it absolutely does. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, and when you have a virtual presentation, always it's a great new, brand new 21st century best practice. Everybody shows up early. We do a comms check. We check mics. We make sure everybody can be seen. All those good things. Yeah. Yeah, so that's I'm glad that's at the top of the list actually because yeah, how many I'm sure all of us if we were in a room would raise our hand. How many have been on a a virtual meeting presentation where it started 10 minutes late because the organizer or presenter was was fumbling. So, some key points here uh when we're talking about actually presenting rehearsing and getting better and then the last couple of slides which we're not going to really delve into spencer mentioned there's a whole lot of information out there but we all need to get probably better and more informed i don't think this is going away this is going to continue to be a thing is presenting through online platforms and there's so many of them we have to be familiar with them each time because they're all a little bit different but again rehearsing be familiar with the functionality the chat um, you know when do we use the webcam when not do we stand do we sit do we move do we sit still it's all part of practicing uh, and seeing how we look from the the, the receivers side so uh, just be aware of those additional tips lighting your background, uh, I have to switch, if you don't use a canned background, you know, a, a pre-pasted background, template, whatever they, I don't know what the right word is. I, I like to use my natural background in my office, but I have to adjust my blinds based on the time of day. And so, um, you know, be aware of the background, the lighting, uh, make sure we do the sound check, uh, there's always going to be possible interruptions and loss of connectivity and things. Have a contingency plan. Uh, so make sure we view and practice. Any last tips on this, uh, Spencer, before we wrap up? Um, I would, <clears throat> yeah, I would just say, um, I'm trying to think of one, right? One good tip, and that's position your camera so that when you're looking at the screen and you're looking at them, your eyes aren't too far from them, right? Mm -hmm. You um, Now, we are used to, so eye contact. A lot has been made in recent days of the idea of, well, make sure you have eye contact. Stare at that little camera on the top of your laptop, right? At the same time, uh, that's one indicator of connection, eye contact. The other is that you are actually listening and you're nodding and you're actively listening and you're acknowledging. And even if your eyes, because they're down on the little Brady Bunch square of the person who's talking to you, even if your eyes aren't glued to the little red or green dot on your camera, right, um, and you are shaking your head and you are actively listening, they have the experience of feeling listened to and connected with. Right. Another tip I'd give you is turn off your self view on any of these platforms. Zoom has three little dots. It says hide self view. Turn off your self view so you're not staring at yourself. You are forced to be with your customer. That is literal customer focus. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, our next webinars, our, our next two coming up are, are here. We're going to talk. I'm, I'm going to do a repeat of what we did at APMP. Yeah, in Dallas, uh, trust in, in business development and business winning, it was a, a big topic. How do we learn to trust each other and our teams? And how do we build trust with the customer? Uh, and then the other one in September, what is a BDCMM? And we'll, we'll let you figure out what that is, uh, either at the webinar or, <laughs> or after. But thank you all for joining. Um, summary, just plan, prepare, practice. It's all about the customer, focus on the evaluation factors, hot buttons and discriminators, and for sure, be sure at the end of your briefing, your presentation, the customer knows why you, why would they choose you? So there's Spencer and my and Mallory's information and information, and you'll have all have access to this about Spencer, his background and his book.
So thank you all. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Um, hope you'll join us on a future webinar. And thanks for your questions and input. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Spencer and Mallory. Thank thanks, you. Brad. Thanks, Mallory.